John said he's trying to power his instrument array. This is called Pico Hydro Power. And that big white pipe goes way up the hill. This is the intake manifold. We got a little stream coming down the hill here. We just kind of dug out a little basin, filled these bags with gravel and other stuff to make a little check dam so that it's deep enough to submerge the intake pipe there. And then it just comes out and goes on down the hill. So I wanted to make sure that it hadn't failed in some way, either the, the dam would get undermined or the little basin fill up with sediment and, and or otherwise clog up the intake. I think you can get a pretty decent view of the intake manifold here. A pipe with a bunch of holes drilled in it and then screening around the pipe. I'm just slightly concerned that it might have completely filled up with mud, but it seems to not have done that, which is good, and neither has the dam, such as it is, has been undermined in any way that I can tell. John is gluing the jets in place that will shoot the water against the blades of the turbine, spin it, spin current through our wire up to our batteries and thereby power the antenna array so that we can collect data. So here again, John lounging in the creek. That's what grad school is all about, right John? It's a beautiful day, huh? Yeah. This is Oregon. This is the Oregon Coast Range. It is March. After drought for most of the winter, it's been raining like crazy since sometime in February. So you see that gray thing, that is the permanent magnet alternator. And then the, you see those blades on there, on the turbine, these little jets, these little brass nozzles you can just see there at the end of that white pipe. So uh, that's going to shoot water out. Those jets hook up to those pipes, they hook up to a four-way manifold, which is hooked up to this reducer here from the two inch pipe down to three quarter and then half. And you see there's a quarter turn ball valve up there, that red thing. When we open that valve, that water will come streaming out of there through this pipe. We're not gonna leave it tied up to the tree like it is right now. We've got this bucket here, but for now we've got the bucket off so we can get the nozzles in place and make sure that thing works. I wanted to show you these log dams. This is the downstream one that we designed with the help of the Forest Service Biology, Justin Gerding and Jack Sleeper. And the idea here was that you'd create some kind of backwater behind it at high water. <laughs> you can see that flow is really ripping through that stretch there, but those roots sticking into the channel would somewhat confine the flow against this bank here and actually cause some bank erosion, which is what we wanted so that even as you impound some sediment upstream of some of these log dams that through the bank erosion you liberate some source of sediment for the downstream reach. And as you can see, there's a clump of bank material that has collapsed within the past few weeks, so it is working. Similarly, the upstream one shows ample evidence of abundant recent bank erosion, that evidence being overhanging vegetation mat. Anyway, check it out. While we're waiting for the glue to dry, we've got to show you some of the instrumentation here. So this is a tuning box. See the black wire coming in that comes from the box housing our data logger and multiplexer and batteries and now the hookup from the, current, from the new generator. And these wires coming out the bottom are basically the antenna. And they go into the creek for that. The idea here is that the current goes through the antenna, charges the little pit tags, which then send a signal and ping the antenna as they go skipping by. 
Now, right over there, I guess you can see sticking out of the ground a pipe with a white cap on it and some flagging tied around it. That is one of our piezometers. And over here, that's another piezometer so that we've got water surface elevation upstream and downstream of the antenna and in combination with surveying the cross section of the channel we can get the total boundary shear stress because once we know the discharge and the cross section we can find the depth the width and the velocity and the changes in those things are related to the total boundary shear stress so we can thereby calculate the total boundary shear stress now that's not the shear stress that's actively moving sediment because Total boundary shear stress is partly taken up by form drag off of the logs, but it's a start. This site map shows the placement of piezometers, antennas, and the gravel pieces embedded with passive integrated transponders. We can't wait any longer. We're going to fire it up. John is going to turn the valve. Water is going to start shooting out. That's only an eighth of a quarter turn valve. Uh, crank it. You can hear the uh, the turbine rattling away now. And you can kind of detect the, the movement of it oh, by, because it's slightly uneven. So you can see its edge kind of going up and down. The multiplexer in this box controls four of the eight antennas in the array. These are the batteries. A little Pelican case there has the instruments in it. So we've got this switch. Feed current to the batteries when the batteries are charging and dump current to ground when the batteries are full. Here's a generator and it's purring along and measuring the current. So it's putting out between 0.72 and 0.8 amps. This is the primary box. It has a generator, tools, four more batteries, and another four-way multiplexer so it controls the other four antennas. When we hooked both arrays to the generator, they generated noise that interfered with each other. So while the current that we measured should have been enough to power both arrays, we have to add a second generator so that they can run off the independent circuits so that we don't get noise interference. 